It's my pleasure to introduce Carlos Saavedra. Uh, Carlos migrated to Boston, Massachusetts at the age of 12 uh, with his parents as an undocumented student. At the age of uh, 16, he became active in the immigrant rights movement, fighting for equal access to higher education for undocumented youth in the United States, the so-called DREAMers. And in 2005, he, uh, he became the co-founder and lead organizer for the student immigrant movement, a new statewide um, organization for undocumented youth. In 2007, after an immigrant raid uh, that targeted 351 people in New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, which almost destroyed the town, Carlos and others organized to address the devastation of family separation as a result of the U.S. immigration policies. This moment became a turning point for Carlos as he began to see the movement bigger than just college access for undocumented youth. Uh, Carlos then dedicated five years to build um, the organization by growing membership and launching campaigns to stop deportations, support students with college access, and confront uh, politicians in order to uh, support the fight for protecting the rights of undocumented, the undocumented community. Uh, Carlos became the national coordinator for the United We Dream Network, uh, which is the first immigrant uh, youth national organization. Uh, he led organizing um, campaign efforts that expanded from like the informal network to a more established um, organization that was comprised of 52 member um, organizations regionally and cover around uh, 30 states in the US. After an intense 2009-2010 DREAM Act campaign, Carlos was uh, chosen as, uh, as one of the 2010 Progressive Activists of the Year awarded by The Nation magazine. Uh, most recently, Carlos played a role in organizing the NR Pain and the Right to Dream campaigns from 2011 to 2012, uh, which marked an important milestone for the immigrant uh, rights movement in the United States. On June 15, 2012, President Barack Obama announced um, a new relief program called Deferred Action for Dreamers. Although a temporary solution in the absence of uh, comprehensive immigration reform, Deferred Action became one of the biggest victories. In in the last 26 years of the immigrant rights movement by providing temporary work authorization and deportation relief for more than 800,000 undocumented students. At age of 26, Carlos has trained over 4,000 people in the arts of organizing and social change in 20 states. Over the, uh, the years, Carlos learned the craft of relational organizing and movement building. He is currently a consultant in immigrant rights uh, um, organization and is developing a training institute for social change. Um, this is not the first time Carlos comes here to uh, London. Uh, this is his third visit here in the United Kingdom where he ha has also trained other uh, local immigrant rights organizations and building their capacity to support the rights of re refugees. Uh, we are very honored to have him uh, with us in, in his visit at, at the third annual uh, Migration Research Unit Student Conference. And without further ado, I'd like to um, pass the floor to Carlos Adelga. Thank you. You're the best. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. I, I want to thank Nancy because she and Vanessa, they were the one that brought me here, so I'm very excited. Uh, I don't like bios too much because uh, they're all weird to me. Like I was making a joke with Nancy today, like maybe we should add to my bio that my first word was immigration when I was like a baby. Like, that, <laughs> that will make me more committed to the movement or something. But I wanted to... Take a little bit of time. Uh, sorry I wasn't able to be with you throughout the whole day. I saw the agenda, but I just been from meeting to meeting, I just feel if I get more information in my brain, I'll probably explode or something. Um, so I wanted to get a chance uh, to talk to you about uh, myself, my community, and about a movement uh, that I've been part of for now a couple of years, um, also called the Dream Movement or the Dreamer Movement or the Dream Act Movement or the 20 million names that sometimes we want to give it to it. Uh, I also want to say before I start that I'm going to tell a story of about 10 years in about 40 minutes. So I'm not going to tell everything. Uh, also that I'm telling the story from my perspective, but there is uh, many other actors in the story, uh, other organizers, other leaders, and I'm just one of them. So, you know, I just want to make sure people know that I was just part of a team that makes something happen and I wasn't the only one. That's maybe the story sometimes because it's, I'm telling it through my lens, it might feel like it. But let's get started. Let's see if you like it. If not, it's okay. You can also leave another stuff. Okay. So it all starts with me. This is myself, and that's my young brother, Rodrigo. We came to the U.S. at age of 12. I was 12. My brother was four years old. We migrated from Lima, Peru, and we went to Boston. Uh, pretty much the reasons why we left was because my mother 
uh, had lost her job. She was really struggling economically, and both my parents couldn't really support us. Uh, plus, we had a civil, kind of a civil war going in Peru at that time that led, you know, tens of thousands of Peruvians to live through the 90s. We were kind of like the last batch of Peruvians to leave. So when I was 12, you know, I came in to, the, to, you know, to Boston, and I thought you know, it was really exciting. I was going to get to meet Mickey Mouse and all that stuff. That's at least the promises my mom told me. Uh, but I came with a tourist visa, and six months later, my visa expired. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of knew a little bit at 12 what it meant for my visa to expire, but I really didn't know in depth what it meant legally. Uh, and about six months later, or a year after we came to the U.S., my grandfather became very ill. He had been ill for a while, I think for a couple of years. He was, you know, always a little bit sick, but he became really, really ill like he was going to die. And it was around actually my birthday uh, that he passed away. And I remember my mother, my aunts, and the people there uh, really not able to go see him because, of course, as you know, if we would leave, we would be banned from the country for 10 years and not coming back in. And I would just ask my mom, Mom, why can't you go? Why can't you go say goodbye to Grandpa? Why can't you, you know, go to his funeral? And my mom said, well, if we go, we can't come back, you know? And that was how I understood what it meant to be undocumented. That's pretty much when I found out, oh, okay, this is a little bit of what this means. Uh, a little fast forward, when I was 16, a group of students at my high school started to talk about what it meant to be undocumented. And they started talking about it and all this stuff. And they did this one big event where they, go, they went out to City Hall and they told stories, you know, to talk about the cause. It took them about a year to organize it. So I got invited to this thing. So I went to this thing. And, you know, I don't know, if, I don't know how all of you were in high school, but I was kind of like those people that like to laugh about everything, like a big joker about everything. It was, I think, the way that I deal with all the uncertainty of being undocumented, you know. So I remember going to the event and my friends are there and everybody's wearing green T-shirts and stuff. And everybody's... Uh, talking about, and then there's this young woman, a uh, friend of mine, Monica, she's, you know, all the way telling her story, and she's just crying her heart out, you know, and she just cannot even get through the whole story, she's crying it out, but essentially what she was saying is that she couldn't go to school because they were going to charge us two to three times the tuition prices, right, and, you know, we, we can afford it, and, but at that time, you know, I knew she was undocumented when she told the story, but I, it was one of those things, like, at that time, you would have to understand a documented language to understand what she was saying because it was all kind of in code, you know, like it was kind of implicit that she was undocumented, but not explicit. So I went to talk to her and said, hey, Monica, what's the deal? You're like, what's up? Why are you crying? She's like, oh, I don't know, Carlos, I don't have papers. And I was like, you don't have papers? I was like, well, I don't have papers either, you know? And she's like, why are you so excited? I was like, well, I don't know. Nobody talks about it, you know? And then I said, well, who else here doesn't have papers? And she's like, well, him, her. I mean, it was like 20 other people that have papers. So... And I think for me, I just, uh, it wasn't like I was so good about it. It was for me that I, just talking about it was a good thing. Does that make sense? That's why I had some emotion about it. So Monica said, look, we're fighting to get in-state tuition, right, so that we can go to school. Because at that time, if we would go to, like, the University of Massachusetts, we will have to pay $22,000 instead of $6,000 a year with no financial aid, no scholarships. My mom is a domestic worker. My dad is a janitor. Like, there was no way we could afford any of this stuff, you know? So we started doing this campaign. We went to high schools. We went everywhere. And uh, we talked to politicians. I mean, we did the whole nine yards. And then I graduated high school in about 2004. And I was really proud because I was graduating and I was wearing my cap and gown. I was getting my diploma because we had just passed this law in two of the chambers of the legislature, the House of Representatives and the Senate. And I don't know about you, but for me, passing a law while being undocumented is the most bizarre experience in the world. Because you're supposed to be unlawful, but then you're creating laws. I mean, to me, that just, but I don't know, I was a little cocky when I was 18. You know, so I was like really proud that I was going to pass this law, you know. Three day, we just needed the signature of the governor. Uh, so three days later, we, my mother opens the newspaper, and in one side of the newspaper is our governor. Have you heard of Mitt Romney? Oh, Mitt Romney was our governor for eight years. Mitt Romney comes out, you know, newspaper, his face is this size, his teeth are about this size. <laughs> and Mitt Romney is pretty much saying that he's going to veto, veto this law, so he's not going to sign it. And he's going to go against every legislator or politician that went for this law. And he's going to go after those benefit illegal askers, as he called us. And the other side of the newspaper is a picture of two of my friends and myself saying how pretty much we're going to beat up Romney. In very few words, that's probably what we said. 
course, my mom looks at me and says, Carlos, you're crazy. What are you doing? You know, uh, you know, what, what are you, why are you, um, you're going to get yourself deported. And I was like, of course, mom, not. We have it all under control. Of course, inside of myself, I'm like dying of fear that we're going to get deported because the governor is coming out against us, you know? So uh, I went in and worked for a restaurant for many years, for, actually not for many years, for many months uh, as a busboy from 10 to, you know, 1 a.m. every day for a while because I couldn't go to college. And my dream was to be a concertist pianist. I wanted to play the piano, and I like Beethoven and, and all those fellas. They were very inspirational to my young years. So before I continue, I want to tell you just not also about myself, but just also about the immigrant rights movement in the U.S. Uh, because I think the political context makes everything make a lot of sense. Things start for us way, way back, but I'm just going to start from 2001. In 2001, does anybody know who this guy is, the one on the left from Bush? Who is he? What is it? Vicente Fox, right? The president of? Of Mexico, right? So Vicente Fox comes to the U.S. in September 6, 2001. He goes and he goes out of the White House and shakes hands with George Bush and says, look, we are going to pass a legalization or an amnesty program, as they call it at that time, and we're going to legalize the five million undocumented people in the country at that time, the five or six million people in the country. They're shaking hands. George Bush is really excited because in the U.S. we have a very big Latino population. We're about 50 million people about at this point. And we are considered a swing vote for the elections when they become presidentials. So George Bush uh, wanted to really be the hero of Latinos by giving them our papers, you know. So they do this and they go to the White House and everybody's thinking we're going to win a legalization. Uh, five days later, uh, September 11 happened, the terrorist attack on September 11 happened, and everything gets destroyed in those promises. George Bush creates something called the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and actually Immigration Naturalization Services, which was its own organization within the government, uh, gets annihilated and becomes part of the Department of Homeland Security, which means that immigration in the U.S. shifted dramatically after 9-11 from being about uh, welcoming people in some ways or processing documentation as the first part was enforcement. I hope that makes some sense. So. I think for us, the word immigrant became associated with the word terrorist, which I know that it's not just in the U.S., but in that, I'll just tell you from my experience there, that's what it became. And things became very hard. I mean, I don't even want to share all the stuff that happened to the Muslim or the Arab community in the U.S. and the deportations that they endure in 2002 and forward because of this phenomenon. I mean, they use this word nuts. Uh, but many of us at that time uh, knew that we couldn't win anything nationally. The climate was just too toxic. Uh, so for a period of 2002, 2004, we started local state battles for driver's license, higher education access, building immigrant coalitions. This is some of the pictures of our rallies and events. Uh, and as I was telling you, we were, we were also one of those small student groups fighting for institution rights in our state, right? Uh, but then... Uh, also, we were trying to figure out deportation campaigns. And in 2005, this young woman here, Marie Gonzalez, these are her two parents, she was going to get deported. Actually, she was going to get deported July 5th, too. Okay, I don't know why everybody gets deported on my birthday. But she was going to get deported on that, uh, on that day with her parents. And there was this huge national campaign that we were also part of. And uh, at that time, George, it was really hard because George Bush was our president. So like, it was like, how are you going to appeal to George Bush to do anything? especially when it quote-unquote comes for illegals, right, as the media portrays us. Uh, so there was this huge campaign for about a year, and the interesting thing that for us was a huge breakthrough, even though it wasn't as great, is that actually Marie was saved from deportation, and she was granted a work permit at the same time by giving something called deferred action in 2005. And for us, that was a huge victory, because we felt like, oh my God, we can save one person from deportation. It was a big deal. The problem was that they deported Marie's parents. And she became separated from her parents for, I think, about six years or something. It was crazy. Uh, so I'll continue. Then as I was working for this restaurant, uh, I was really frustrated. Has anybody got frustrated? Do you get frustrated too? <laughs> OK, good. I just wanted to ask you. But uh, I got really frustrated. And I went to talk to my father because you know I want to get advice from him. And I don't know about your fathers, but my dad was a um, do you say football or soccer here? Football. football. Okay, um, I apologize. We've been brainwashed in America to not like football anymore. I'm sorry, Spain. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry for any people that got offended by that. I'm sorry. I, I was supporting Spain. 
not really, but okay. Uh, so, sorry, I can just stop thinking about the game. So I was talking to my dad, and I told to my dad, well, you know, so because my dad was a football guy in Peru for many years, uh, he, anytime I want to ask him for advice about, hey, dad, I have a problem with my girlfriend, or I have a problem with my faith, with God, with school, he always tells me football story. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? Like, I don't understand what Jesus has to do in the goalie and all this stuff. Like, I just don't get it, you know? So I just get confused. And one time I asked, well, that tell me, you know, what do you think? He says, look, Carlos, you just got to understand this. And he just starts telling me a soccer story, a football story. And I'm like, okay, well, that, can you go say that again? Because I don't really understand. And he's like, well, you understand, you, had a, you play a game, but you don't have a team. And he's like, I don't understand you, Dad. Can you, like, tell me that? Because I was frustrated, you know, because I don't get the stories at all for years, you know? And he says, look, let me tell it to you in very simple words. People came together for a game which was a sin state tuition campaign, right? But when people come together for a game, they only come together because they want to win. But when they lose, they break apart. They, they didn't come back together for anything else in the game. So, but if you form a team, you will be together because the game is just part of your journey. And he told me one thing that I'll never forget. He said, even if you lose with a team, you can get stronger. If you lose the right way. And I was like, is there a way to lose the right way? I just <laughs> didn't know my dad was giving me mad wisdom. I just was too young to understand it. So we went out and I quit my job and we went and formed an organization called the Student Immigrant Movement. That's one of our leaders from many years ago, Constanza. Uh, you know, can cough, magnifying, undocumented at that time, magnifying the injustice for immigrants. And this was around 2006. And in 2006, uh, a couple of months before in December in 2005, there has been a very anti-immigrant law passed called Sensenbrenner HR 4437. Have people heard about this law before? Raise your hand just to know. Okay, just very few. HR 4437 was a law that pretty much said that if you were the friend of an undocumented person, you will go to jail. If you were the pastor of a church, you will have to report to immigration if you're, some of your congregants were uh, undocumented. If you were a taxi driver and you were caught up with taking a ride to an undocumented person, you will also go to jail. It was a very punitive, one of the most punitive laws that we have seen in the U.S. This law passed by a majority vote in the House of Representatives uh, in 2005, at the end of the year. Uh, I want to put this out there because how many, of you, how many countries are here? Just a question. Is there many countries or is it just one? Or the UK? Quite a lot of countries. Okay. I don't know how it feels to work with migrant rights in your countries, but at that time in the U.S., it felt completely depressing. I just want to say, like, it's like we have 9-11, right? We're not winning anything. And in 2005, they passed this law that if we have even friends, we're going to get deported and they're going to get deported. And for us, the, the, the movement was just so dark. So we started doing some mobilizations. And because the law was so punitive, it mobilized hundreds of hundreds of thousands of people which led to the 2006 marches. And I put this out there because it was the largest mobilizations of immigrants, or actually of anybody, in the history of the United States. It was larger than the mobilizations of the civil rights movement. It was larger than the mobilizations of the, against the Vietnam War. 40 million people went out to the streets. We're talking about that about 10 to 11 percent of the population went out for about five months to the streets. It was insane. The media cataloged this as the giant has awakened because it was so many people on the streets every week, every Monday. It was massive. Uh, and it was so massive that this anti-immigrant law died. They didn't pass it in the Senate, which for us was a huge thing. Because it was like, you know when you're very shy about your status and about the movement and then you have 40 million people on the street? It changes the whole game. You know, you know, like I was there, my young brother and I were there, you know, we're like, we're going nuts at those times, you know. And it was really the first time where there was an immigration reform passed in the U.S. Senate. Not that it passed completely, it just passed one chamber, uh, which was passed by uh, Senator Kennedy and actually Senator John McCain at that time, which for us was a big deal. Now you got to understand this. 2006 happens where 40 million people on the street. I got back to my high school times. I was feeling very confident. So after that, Actually, what happens, and we'll talk about this at the end, is because I, I went to college for about a semester. Uh, I went to the conservatory, then I went to community college for about a semester. And I asked my teacher about uh, if she was going to talk about the marches, because we were having a class with her the day before one large march. And in my town of Boston, in my city, we're having like thousands of people come out. I mean, it was like huge. 
And I asked her, are you going to talk about this in college? And she said to me, Carlos, that's not really important. So I got really, really mad. Because it was like my politics class. You're not going to talk about the greatest mobilizations in US history. And there's like half of your students are immigrant. What's the deal, you know? So I quit school and I, um, I, because I wanted to learn organizing. I wanted to learn how to build organizations. And that took me a whole journey to understand what I call the science of organizations and the science of movements. So I'm going to tell you the story of the dream movement, but I want you to understand that underneath all this, there's a theory that we are operating under. It's not just passion or drive. There are some clear strategic decisions that we're making, and I'm going to try to decompress them at the end in some small way, just to put it out there. What happens, and the reason why I say this, is because in movements, when you get a majority of the population engaged, and I want to say this, but a large percentage, about 20 to 30 percent of the Latino voters, which we're talking about maybe 20 million Latino voters in the U.S., went from the Democratic Party, from, sorry, from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party after the marches. That's a huge percentage for a, people, a group of people to flee a political party. What also happens is that 40 million people see you in the street, and the people that are really against you, your opposition, come out massively in numbers too. So at that time, we had the Minutemen created, which were uh, kind of a vigilante group that went to the border to try to take care of immigration laws if the government wasn't going to do it. Uh, and we had all these anti-immigrant laws. And George Bush decided that he was going to target businesses and factories and have raids and operations there. So as you can see, that's a raid from, the, from New Bedford, uh, Massachusetts. It's a neighborhood about uh, an hour and a half from my house. There were 361 people detained by immigration by around 600 immigration agents. Uh, and they pretty much destroyed the town. Um, you know, we had people in Iowa also in rates. There were rates everywhere. So for us, we went from hope to massive amounts of despair in 2007. We were just trying to survive because we were like, oh my God, that, that deportation machine is just growing. Uh, but also something happened, uh, which was that uh, President Barack Obama got elected. And he got elected by winning a large majority of the Latino community to win him over, and also the African-American community turning out dramatically for him. And this gave a lot of momentum to him because pretty much the Latino vote became much more important, if, if you put it, put it that way. Now, even though all this stuff is happening, this is actually a picture of my brother. Even all this stuff is happening, when I graduated high school, I made a promise to my brother. I said to him, look, Rodrigo, uh, when you become older, uh, you know, maybe when you're 18 or when you graduate high school, uh, I'm going to make sure that you get something, either a work permit, an idea, or something, so that you can pretty much not struggle the same way I did. So I made this promise to my brother. And I've been working in this organization called the Student Immigrant Movement with all, all my other peers. And my brother one day comes to my room, and has anybody seen the movie Shrek? What's the name of the cat? Say, can you say it one more time? I don't know how to say it well because I'm an immigrant, but uh, he, have you seen the eyes that Puss in Boots does? The eyes like this? They're adorable, right? So my brother comes to my room with those eyes, and he comes and he reads me a letter, and the letter pretty much says, um, you know, dear parents of Rodrigo Saavedra, your son has been invited to, for a whole trip over the summer to go to China. He won a scholarship to go to China with his class for the summer. And, you know, I can only imagine, I mean, I dream of those things when I was his age, you know, like everybody will go on trips and we will never go, you know, because we couldn't, you know. And he asked me, well, Carlos, can I go, you know, and it's like, you know, and the sad part is that I've, I wanted to tell him yes, uh, but I had to tell him no, because in reality he couldn't go. And in some ways I, if, you know, it broke his heart because it was his dream. You know, he still wants to go. And, uh, and uh, you know, and it broke my heart. You know, and it made me really sad for a while. Because I just felt like, what's the point of dropping out of school? What's the point of doing this? Or maybe I'm just not caught up for this, you know? But it also made me angry. And it made me feel like, like, I, we have to do something more. Like, it, my brother was like maybe four years from being 18, you know? I was like, four years have passed and I haven't done... I feel like I hadn't done anything, like I haven't gotten anything for him, you know. He was a metaphor for the struggle that I was in, you know. Um, so I got really mad for a while and there's, you know, and it wasn't, I wasn't the only one getting mad. There were other peers of myself and myself getting mad. And we started an organization and I, I, I pretty much said to myself, I started imagining at the time, well, 
I cannot win in my state alone, in my city. I need to go across the country. We need to build something larger, you know? And we went out and we built this organization called the United We Dream Network. And we started just this, our, our first funding meeting. We started really with a couple of groups, uh, around one, two, three, four, six or seven across the country. And I got hired to be their national coordinator, uh, which meant that I, you know, clean after the meetings, I run the budgets and do everything and try to go everywhere. I traveled for about 20 out of 30 days for about four years. So I was constantly on the road trying to talk to people, build teams and build organizations. And that's what we did. So in 2009 and 10, when we started, we started building groups. We trained about 2,000 people in those first two years in community organizing. We went and formed teams dramatically. Uh, we fought deportations like Walter's deportation was there. We were, have national congresses and all the good stuff. And there is two theories to our strategy, and I'll just give them to you because I think it should be used everywhere. But one theory is that we had to tell our stories because if we didn't tell our stories, then somebody else would, right? As you know, the stories of immigrants in the newspapers are very dirty, are very bad, are very toxic. So that was our first strategy. The second strategy is we're going to try to pass this law called the DREAM Act. And the DREAM Act was this law that will give us documentation if we wanted to go to the college or the military. And that will pretty much do that for about two million undocumented young people in the U.S. So we said, how can we pressure and do those two things as much? And if you will see in the next couple of minutes when I share this, that's the only two things that we're really doing all the time, at least when we're not that confused. So we started first, we started telling stories, and then we wanted to tell stories more broadly so that we're coming out actions, uh, meaning people will claim, and we, people borrow this from the LGBTQ struggle and say, we got to come out and say that we're undocumented or some documented and afraid and more things. People will do this outside of, of malls. People will do this outside of uh, in city hall. Some people will do it outside of immigration. I mean, everywhere. And of course, there was a lot of fear. I don't want to say that it was just like we made a decision to not have fear and then the fear left. No, there was a lot of fear and struggle. And a lot of people didn't want to come out at those times. But what happened is that we noticed that we could save people from deportation. And that gave some sort of cloud of somewhat support from the struggle. Does that make sense? The organization provided support for people to take greater risk. But then we say, well, how can we tell a story that is much bigger? How can we dramatize this more? And for example, a group of students uh, did a march, Gabby, Juan, Isabel, and Carlos did a march called the Trail of Dreams, which they literally march. Let me see if I can get it here. From here, from Miami, Florida, all the way up there to Washington, DC. They march for about five months, 1,500 miles. And they pretty much said to immigration, you know, you know, if you want to come, if you want to get us, just come get us, you know. And immigration, of course, didn't. So there was all this action, which we call direct action. There was hunger strikes. This young woman here, the one in the yellow t-shirt, she did a hunger strike for about 40 days. We were carrying her in a wheelchair around Washington, D.C. There was all this action, all this activity, as you can see in the pictures here, right? There were many students at civil disobedience. There were activists outside of the state house in my town in Massachusetts. Uh, we were spelling the word dream in Miami, Florida, because that's the only way you can get attention in Miami, I guess. Uh, we were outside of the, of the White House for about 21 days doing a, a, a mock university. That's myself and my brother right there in the heat of Washington, D.C. So there was just a lot of activity, a lot of action, a lot of storytelling, and a lot of building of new membership and groups. So I'm telling you to tell you two things. I'm telling you the whole movement story, but I think it's important maybe to say, well, how do we run one campaign within the whole struggle of a couple of years? That might be useful, right? So in 2010, no, nine, 10, 10, yeah, 10, sorry, too many years. In 10, the, I don't know, how many people are from the UK here? Raise your hand if you're from the UK. Okay, what is the good political party in the UK? <laughs> there isn't, okay. In the U.S., the quote-unquote good political party are the Democrats. Who are your bad parties here? UKIP, okay, for us are the Republicans, right? The, the equation of the UKIP for us is the Tea Party. Uh, so the quote-unquote good guys had lost one of the chambers, which was the House of Representatives. They lost, and then the Republicans were going to take over the House, and then if the Democrats have the Senate, they will never get a, with each other. We will never have any loss. So we're massively depressed because we're thinking, oh my God, people have done the, the civil disobedience, people have done the hunger strikes, people have been marching, coming out, we've been traveling everywhere trying to organize groups. Nobody wants us, nobody cares for us. And then we found out that 
in Congress, there is this period of 15 days where politicians that from the old party can come back and do laws. It's called the lame duck campaign. I don't know if it's an English thing. I don't know. I've been trying to look through my colonizing history if it goes back, but I don't know. But they have 15 days. And in those 15 days, they can pass any law. But most of the time, they don't do really much. I don't know if that makes, oh, I don't know. Politicians don't do really do much anywhere, but you know what I mean. Uh, they don't do much. So what we would say, we, we, sometimes I think the moments of greatest pessimism can be the moments of greatest mobilization. That's at least what it creates to me in my heart. And we figure out, well, what if we really do our last push? Like, we got to end the year with, like, with everything, you know, with, like, everything. It was like, we got to just take the whole thing in. And we said, well, let's do a campaign. Let's, do, let's, let's go to D.C. Let's force them to take a vote on this. And we did that. So what would happen is uh, we mobilized uh, about 100 dreamers at the beginning of young people, and then we went to have 300 consistently for a, for a long period of time. But what would happen is that you would have uh, people will come to the office. They will take a picture of any of the politicians uh, at that time of the congressional members. Then they will get on a team because we do everything in teams. And then we will go and talk to them. Now, I don't know. Has anybody talked to a politician here? Yes, some of you? Okay, who has not talked to a politician? Raise your hand if you have never talked to a politician. Raise your hand. Perfect, perfect. Okay, politician class number one on one. Okay, when you go to a politician, uh, there's two things. Okay, wait, I mean, okay. okay, you get two things. One, you go ask them if we want something, right? And they tell you they don't like you, they don't support you, they tell you in your face, right? That they don't like you. Most of the time, they don't do that. They do something like this. They go and talk to you. And they say to you, and they touch you on the shoulder, and they tell you, oh my god, you're such a good citizen. You are great. Your work is so inspiring. Only if we had more people like you, everything will be better, you know? And then the law comes to a vote, right? I don't know if any of you have heard of politicians lying or anything like that. Then the law comes to a vote, and they vote against you. And you go talk to them. And you say, what happened? Like, you gave me the shoulder. <laughs> And they say to you, well, you don't understand politics is not in your side. You just don't understand politics, you know? And you're like, but you're just lying to us then. So then what we would do is because we already know all this stuff. We know the shoulder. We will go at 9 a.m. and we'll go meet with them. We'll meet with them at 9 a.m. And we'll get the shoulder or the yelling, but most of the times the shoulder. And then we'll go at 11 a.m. and we'll get the shoulder again. We'll go at 1 p.m. and we'll get the shoulder again. We'll go at 3 p.m. we'll go at 5 p.m. and get the shoulder again. Then we'll go the next day. Then we'll go the following day. Then we'll go the next day and the following day and the next day and the following day. And we'll go so much that you know how when somebody wants to lie to you and they lie so much, they cannot even lie anymore? Like their face starts moving like this, you know? That's what was happening to them. So, plus also, they don't do anything because we're there in the office all the time. And you have so many students coming in, and we're not really antagonistic. We're about telling stories and saying our cause and what we're about, and we wear our caps and gowns, and we look very cute and adorable, because we are. And we try to tell it. So it's really hard for them to be antagonistic. I don't know if that makes sense. And if they do antagonistic, we just look great because we look attack. You know, like, I don't know, but wearing a cap and gown is very symbolic. Because it's such a proud moment for whoever is wearing it, that getting attacked on a cap and gown really messes with people's brain. Doesn't that make sense? OK. So we did this for a period of time. And we were there for 15 days. And I don't know about you, but the media, the, the papers, the TV gets really bored about what people do in protests and all this stuff. They get bored. Because it's like, well, you're protesting again? What's new, right? Are you doing anything new? You know, because I've been covering this. So we're trying to figure out, well, you know, how can we capture the imagination of the American public? What can we do? What can we say? And because it's all about changing the story from what it is to what it should be. And most of the time, the story with the immigrant is we are taking, 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 and we don't give anything, right? Is that true or not? Is that the, that's the most story, right? But uh, in reality, it's not. You know, if we just look across the world, it's not. And we said, okay, well, let's do a service day or a service campaign or something like that. And we said, we're going to show America that we really want to serve America. You know? And we did a couple of different strategies. But one that I want to talk to you about is that we did something uh, called a, a blood drive. And uh, we went out and we called the Red Cross. And they brought their little vans and stuff. And we had 50 students ready to donate blood. And this happened in a couple parts of the country. And they were giving blood. And Rosa right here and Herman, they're giving blood, rock and rolling there, giving blood. And people were golf. And then the media came in like around noon, you know, and they're 
asking, well, we don't understand. Like, you're here in Washington, D.C., you're trying to win this DREAM Act law, you've been here for 15 days, why are you giving blood? This makes no sense. Like, how is this going to change the, politicals, the politician's heart? And we're like, well, we don't know. But essentially what we wanted to ask America is that we want to know if America wants our illegal blood or not. Would you take our illegal blood? And then, first of all, the concept that somebody's illegal makes no sense, right? Which I'm sure everybody has already said here. But the concept of somebody's blood being illegal is just ridiculous. And you've got to understand that our whole strategy is to make anything funny, hilarious, and ridiculous. Because through humor is how we can organize a lot of people. Why do we do this? Because there's so much pain and struggle, which I'm not sharing all the pains and struggles that many of you probably know that migrants go through in the world. And we call this a dilemma because any situation, either that we, anything that happens, we win. Anything that the opposition happens, they lose. Because let me ask you something. If you take our blood, are you with us, yes or no? Yes or no, are you there? Yes, see, yes. Sorry, I, I, know, I know you haven't done all the research on that, but I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, you do, yes, you support us, right? And if you don't take our blood, are you for us or are you against us? What are you? Against us, right? Okay, thank you. That's great. That's great. I'm glad you did your research in those two seconds. <laughs> now, are you just against us or are you against the whole society of America? Are there more people that value blood, care, and service? So that is what we're, that, that, so we're trying to target the public to change the understanding of who we are through this sort of creative actions. And let me tell you what they said. So this is what you came out in the newspaper, right? Undocumented immigrant students skip blood to show citizenship. Now, most of the pictures of immigrants in most newspapers are pictures of us looking like criminals. Jumpsuits, in detention, right? Uh, very dark pictures of people, you know, like we're in the shadows or something like that. But I want you to see, look at the picture that we have right here. Look how we look, right? Then let me tell you what the newspaper said because that's the most fun part. It says, on Friday, a group of illegal immigrant college students, or dreamers as they call themselves, donated blood at Harvard University and other colleges. The students said they wanted to show the rest of the country that they're ready to perform community service and are good citizens, even if they don't have U.S. citizenship. As someone who's undocumented, I'm not scared about giving blood, said Mega Sharma, 22, whose family came to Massachusetts from India seven years ago, and who donated blood Friday for the first time. I'm scared about the vote in Congress. Okay, this story is starting good. Let's see what happens. U.S. Senator John Kerry, a Democrat from Massachusetts, said the students are reminding everyone what it really means to be American. Duh, of course we are. <laughs> then he says these beautiful words. He says only three in a hundred Americans will ever donate blood despite the need. But these kids are living out of the real full measure of citizenship, he said. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> he says they're living, breathing testimony of, impor of importance of passing the DREAM Act. He's being a sweetheart right now, no? It's like, of course we're awesome. Yes, we are awesome. We give a lot to this country. But this is, the people supporting you is one thing. Your opposition going against you is the best things when you do stuff like this. Because look at what she said. Marie Parente, a former Massachusetts state representative who opposed efforts to give the state's illegal immigrants institutions, said the blood donation drive did little to change her opinion that the DREAM Act was wrong. She compared illegal immigrants donating blood to win sympathy with serial killers donating blood to get out death row. What if a guy on death row says, I'll give you a pint of blood for the rest of my life, just to get me out of here? Said Parente, 82 of Milford, Milford is baseless. What does it do when somebody says something like this? We, got, we all know that the reason why migrants are in different countries is because, well, one, because of major conflicts in different places of the world. But one of the major reasons is because the United States and most of the countries in Europe Right? And some countries in Asia have really you know, destroyed our countries, like Latin America, like Africa. And there are so many economical problems because of the abuse and the exploitation that people have migrated. All this has been organized, at least in the U.S., through the system of racism. So at the end of the day, the, being against immigrants is the new cool thing about being racist. Right? Being racist, the new cool form of being racist is being anti-immigrant. It's like, no, no, I'm not racist. I like everybody, but those are bad, right? And if you look at who are immigrants in mostly, it's people of color across the world, right? 
So I just want to put out there that what we're trying to do is to surface the conflict. And we do this to make it creative so it captures the imagination of the people, but to actually have a response that says what's the underlying conflict, which is race, which is antagonism. Because when you look at this picture here, who do you see there? You know? Is it a criminal? Is it a terror? Whatever people like to call us. Or is it just a regular human being that wants to live a normal life in the U.S.? So that's what we're trying to do. But I'll keep going. Is this good? Are you liking this story? Is this good? Okay. I, sh should, I, should I continue? No? Okay. I just want to make sure you're getting pleased. I want to meet your needs. Okay. So we did all this stuff, right? All these actions, the blood drives, those, all this stuff. And I would love to go through all the actions, but maybe it's too much. I want to make sure we have time to talk and have more questions. But essentially, we were there for 45 days. And Congress was supposed to leave in 15. But because we're there, 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 we're so freaking persistent sometimes. You know, we're kind of a little annoying sometimes. We're there, there, there. That they kept the session going for longer days. And at this time, once we were there for 30 days and stuff, we were getting so much sweet momentum, you know, which is like, oh, yeah, like students were coming out of the woodwork. We're like feeling the vibe, you know. We're like, we're turning this thing around. And they put a vote uh, around the 40th day to pass it in the House of Representatives and to pass the law, which for us was a big deal because having the U.S. Congress address your law because you're pressuring them is a huge deal. And we went through the House of Representatives and we won the vote. And you gotta understand this, we were feeling like we were winning a million dollars. We were like, we're gonna win this, we're gonna take this one home. And of course, at the same time, we're afraid as hell that we're gonna lose. You know, like I just wanna put out there that we're we do, maybe I'm making it over funny because that's how we wanna be in the movement to deal with the anxiety, but very stressful times of deportation and struggle. And five days later, we went out into this vote in the US Senate. We knew we could lose, but we went at it, and it was actually a couple days before Christmas. And many of us are Christian or Catholic or from, the, or from that tradition. And for us, it was a big deal doing this campaign because we were most of us in Washington, D.C., and we were going to come back home. And we wanted to come back home with some gifts. And we were thinking, some of us didn't want to really think about this stuff, but I think some of us thought about it internally because uh, we didn't want to get our hopes up because they've been slashed so many times that we might come back with home with work permits or something like that. And for us, we were just thinking this way. And we thought, well, what if that would happen, you know? And we went on to the vote, and there were uh, 200 of us in the, in the Senate chamber of the, of the US Senate. And we had a vote, but we lost the vote. Uh, we did it 60 votes, 6-0, and we got 55. Five of the good guys, the Democratic Party, voted against us. Uh, quote, unquote, they've always been there with us. They were not. So for us, that was devastating, and uh, you know, you can see here the, the pictures of some of our leaders and really the loss and the sadness that we all went through. Um, you know, I, we were really, really, really tired and really trying to figure out what to do with ourselves, you know. Um, and I went uh, home, back home, and I imagine all of them, everybody went home back home to figure out what the hell we were going to do. And uh, I went to talk to my mom. Um, because I love talking to my mom, and she doesn't tell soccer stories. <laughs> and I went to talk to my mom, and I asked my mom, well, mom, I don't know about how you, your relationship with your mother, but my mom knows what I'm feeling when I don't even know what I'm feeling. She's like a ninja in that kind of sense, like, you know, and, 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 I'm, and I'm a guy, which means that I'm, I wasn't properly trained on how to talk about my emotions, you know? So I'm trying to tell my mom that I'm depressed, but it's like, well, how do you feel? I'm good, but I'm really stressed, you know, she knows it. And, you know, but I opened up to my mom and said, Mom, I feel really frustrated. I don't want to quit because this is really hard, you know. Like, we're, you know, I'm part of this team leading this network and we are losing and people are blaming each other. We're really disorganized. What are we going to do? People in the U.S. don't care about us, you know. They never have. They never will. That was our thinking back then. And my mom said to me, I understand how you feel. I know it's bad and stuff. But she also said to me, look, uh, it's going to just take a little bit more work, you know? And she said to me, look, the difference between the possible and the impossible is just this much. And I was like, first of all, I was like, this much? Like, mom, you're crazy. Like, you know, let me give you the political analysis. Like, we're not going to win. We don't have the votes in the order. I was giving her, but she wasn't talking politics. You know? She was talking faith, you know? And uh, I said, mom, but you don't understand. Like, we've done everything we think we could. People have gone to jail. People have 
work very hard, people have come out, people have had deportations, you know. We gave blood to the country, literally, you know. And my mom said to me, well, sometimes it just takes a little bit more, you know. Sometimes it just takes this little bit more. And I was like, okay, well, mom, you know, I guess you, you're right, because moms are always right, so half, well, at least 80% of the time. And um, many of us, and I imagine, I'm just telling you from my story, I imagine everybody figure out their own way of getting re-motivated. And some people left the movement, too, because they were disillusioned by, by, by this kind of failure. But we came back and we continued to organize. Uh, we rebuilt our organization. We went and trained more leaders. We trained another 2,000 leaders in those two years. And we figured out that um, John Lennon uh, in the 70s have gotten a work permit through the U.S. government, or a green card actually, uh, just without the passes of Congress. The government just gave it to him. And this effect is called deferred action. So we figure out legally, and Nady Dominguez is really the hero of this from California, that really understood this. Um, we figure out that we can just go and target Barack Obama, President Obama, and without Congress, he would need us. And, we, and this equation came because we knew that in two years he was going to have his re-election and he was going to need the Latino electorate, and we wanted to push him. So we went out and did this campaign around him. And at this point, we had already grown dramatically across the country, which I wasn't realizing that we were getting so big, but it was going crazy. And we fought to make deportations immoral. And we did this huge campaign for two years. I would love to tell more stories about it, but I'll just tell the details. I'll tell some small details because we don't have enough time. Uh, about five days before she graduated from college, Mercedes, she was 18, she got detained by immigration. She was placed in jail for about two to three days. Immigration threatened to deport her. Uh, if we would not give them a $5,000 bail uh, money at that time. And through the community action of his local organization, the Tennessee Immigrant Refugee Rights, uh, and, the, uh, and their local group there, they fought and they got her out two days before her graduation. And this is her picture of her graduation. But graduating after being in jail for being an immigrant and having a deportation order is a sweet, and it's, a, I think, much more sour than sweet graduation. It's like you're there, you're graduating, and everybody's happy for what they're moving on in life, and you think you're going to get deported in six months. So we were getting stories like this and leaders like this in many places across the country. So we were really frustrated against Barack Obama and his policies. So there was a time that Barack Obama, uh, a, a national Latino organization called NCLR, invited Barack Obama to speak at their annual conference, with, uh, which 3,000 Latinos go to this conference. And uh, we were thinking, how dare you invite Barack Obama to the conference? He has deported, at that time, one million people. He hasn't delivered anything of his promises. You know, I understand he was a president that we wanted to elect because we had hopes of him. You know, We understand the significance of an African-American becoming president in a country that had slavery for 250 years and oppressed most of its population. But we also understand that we want people that would serve the community. And uh, we try to confront them. And we said, how dare you invite him? And, and then they said to us, well, we don't know. It's the president. We got to invite him. Whatever. He's, you know, they were very excited the president's coming because everyone wants to see the president, right? And we said to them, well, we want to make sure that you highlight that issue of deportations. Uh, and if you're not going to do that, then we're going to get mad. We're going to disrupt your conference. And, of course, they got mad at us because how dare you? And we're like, well, you know, we're the people that get blood, you know, like we're in business. And at the end, they said, okay, let's compromise. We'll have Mercedes at the event. And the president of the organization is going to talk about deportations and ask Obama to be stronger against deportations, et cetera, et cetera. So... What we wanted to actually do, which you know, little did the organization know, was that what we actually wanted to do was we wanted to interrupt the president. Because he was going to say all his appeal, and at the end of the media, everybody was going to clap, and the media will say, Latinos support Obama. They like him. He's doing good. The technicality, he wasn't doing good. He was doing very bad. So we had a plan. And the thing about interrupting the president is it's just a little difficult, because he has something called Secret Service and they might shoot you and all that stuff. But, you know, we always try to figure out a way around things. And the thing was, is like the president was going to say his appeal, which was like, oh, I cannot do anything. I need Congress, and I need the Republicans. I need a dancing partner, whatever his metaphor was at the time. You know? And we were, when he was going to say that, we were going to try to interrupt him to make sure to know that we don't agree with those messages. So 
Mercedes was going to be right there in the, you know, in the, in front of him almost, you know, like the president is like right there and she's like right here sitting down. And when he was going to say those words, Mercedes was going to stand up and a group of people on the back, on the back, on the back, were going to see Mercedes and that was the cue for them to start chanting and interrupting the president. So the president comes in, he's all smooth and stuff, you know. People already had no Mercedes because the president had introduced her, the other person of the organization. So Mercedes is sitting there, she hears the words the president is going to say he cannot do it, you know, like, oh, I can't, they need the dancing partner or whatever. So Mercedes is sitting down, she's wearing cap and gown because that's how we pretty much do everything. And she starts standing up, 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 standing up. And she stands up. And literally there's 3,000 people and you have this one red cap and gown in the middle of the whole thing, right? And of course, in my best dreams, I think the president looked at her and they gave each other eye contact and stuff. <laughs> but she starts getting up and then the people on the back start screaming. Start screaming, yes, you can, yes, you can, yes, you can. And you know, they're chanting, they're getting on top of chairs and stuff. I mean, it's nuts. And you know how people feel something when they, they don't want to do something when they're by themselves, but when they're in a group, they do it. I don't know if you've been there, right? Like somebody starts, and then everybody's like. So everybody was feeling mad. Everybody knew it was BS, clapping to the president, you know, supporting him. Everybody knew he hadn't done enough. So then people are yelling, yes, you can. And then 3,000 people start screaming, yes, you can. And, and clapping, you know. And then the president got totally interrupted. Totally, totally interrupted. I mean, he became a little robber after that. He just didn't know how to finish his sentences. It was a really sad display of leadership for the president at that time. And of course, we're super excited, you know, because the paper says Latinos, boo, Obama, or whatever, interrupt him. And it was really cheesy because we said, yes, you can. You know, which his slogan was, yes, we can. And we just said, yes, you can. What is he going to say? You know, like, no, I can't. You know, it's just, just like <laughs> dumb. So I'll end with this. Obama says, Obama goes to Mercedes at the end of her, goes to her, and says to her, look, don't worry. We're going to take care of you. Which always means just you. <laughs> right? Mercedes takes her cap off, gives it to him, and says to him, just give it back when you take care of all of us. The person takes the cap and walks away. He got the message. So this is one story of many more that not just ourselves, but other people in the immigrant movement did to show the issue of deportations and really challenge the president, which is still going on to this day in a broader issue. Uh, and Obama was confronted on election day. There's a whole New York Times video that talks about the negotiations with the White House that we encountered to try to get this law passed. Uh, but uh, my brother graduated high school, um, and when he graduated high school, and, you know, eight years later after I started, I, I was started part of being of this movement, I felt really utterly depressed again. Because you got to understand, when you haven't won something, you feel you're losing the whole time. <laughs> I don't know if it makes any sense. So for me, it was just like, well, I, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Like, we lost the first time. We're, how are we going to ever, like for us, it was like we believed that we could win, but at the same time, we doubt ourselves we can. Like, how are we going to move the president of the United States of America? That's just nuts. That makes no sense, you know? And even though we had the theory that explained it well, why we could win, you don't believe it until maybe sometimes it happens, you know? So we were, um, I went to his graduation of high school, and I'm totally trying to be f fine with him, you know? He's graduating, but I just feel like a complete utter failure, you know? I'm like, oh, like, this has been, uh, maybe I should leave, like let other people lead and stuff. And I'm just depressed. And um, five days later, the White House calls, uh, and they said to us, we're going to give you pretty much what you want in code language. And I wake up in the morning, and I go, s go to Facebook, and in Facebook, everybody's going nuts because they're passing the press release of the White House saying how the White House is essentially going to give us 1.4 million work permits uh, for young people in the US. And I was just like, holy guacamole. Of course, I didn't believe it for a while because you, you were like, they're lying, they're lying. You know? And I went to wake up my brother and talk to him and say, bro, like, look at the, let's go to Facebook, you know, because that's where everything is happening. And we went to Facebook and we hug each other out and stuff. And, um, you know, it was really, it was a huge, sig significant victory. We still have a lot of issues we're fighting in the U.S. We are far from having one of our largest victories hopefully will happen in the next two years or, or at least a part of this year. But getting a million people or 1.4 million people work permits, especially young people, and, and winning it, not just because the government just wanted to give it to you, but because 
we organized and struggled through it, and hundreds of students were part of this, was a true sweet flavor uh, to us. And um, I remember the words of my mother that it just really takes this much to win. And I didn't know it was true until it happened. And this is a picture of my young brother, Rodrigo. That's the picture of his work permit, of his work authorization, looking very happy. And I think everybody who got the Fred Action looks like that at this point. 800,000 people have qualified for this. So that's the brief story of the Dream Movement from my perspective. Um, but Nancy, do I have five more minutes or no? Okay, I just want to finish with last but This is the story of the movement, a, a small story of the movement, one of them. But I know I'm speaking in a university, so I want to talk a little bit about that and the responsibility that you all have if you want to really study or if you're a migrant or if you really want to study migrant studies or really understand this. I think it's really important to figure that out. Um, so let me see if I have something. I think for the, any movement to really, really, really work, and this may we get into some theoretical stuff, three, three people have to talk or three groups have to talk to each other. It really has to start with the most effective community of the people that are impacted by this issue, whether you're undocumented, a migrant, a refugee. It really has to start with them. They have to be part of it. They have to feel like they're the heroes of the heroes of the story, you know? But second, we've got to figure out what are supportive individuals or organizations. Now, that could be labor unions. That could be... Uh, churches, that could be community organizations, that could be people uh, studying the issue of migration and supporting on that. And then all the leads for us to create wider change with the public. And uh, I want to tell you a story because uh, it is so easy to come here, I think, and say, well, we won, it's so awesome, we did it, we always knew we win. It's not true. We were very afraid and very doubtful of what we were doing most of the time because uh, we just didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> we were trying to figure out as we go. But I'll tell you, my, my, in my experience, in 2008 or seven, when I was organizing the immigrant youth movement, I'd met this guy, Thomas Pinedo Shields. And he was uh, a PhD candidate at that time from Brandeis University. And he came in and wanted to talk to me, and I talked to him. And he said to me, hey, Carlos, I really want to study what you all are doing with your organizing and stuff. And of course, I, for six months, I, would, I wouldn't tell him yes. Because I was like, why is a white guy going to come and try to study my thing? You know, like, who the heck are you and all these things, which I think it was a good challenge for him, you know? It made him really acknowledge what we wanted to do. After six months, and, you know, this guy, Thomas is a sweetheart, you know, like, and I'm, I'm glad that we gave him such a trouble at the beginning. But he came in and he said, look, I really want to understand what you are doing. And... Um, after six months, I said, okay, yes, yes, Tom, let's work on this. And Tom showed me something that uh, for me was good. Let me see if the next quote says it. Okay, let's see. Uh, so he changed all of our names for this study because at that time, people were not fully out with their names yet. So my name is Jorge in, the, in, in his dissertation. Uh, but he says, in September 2008, I received, a, this is from his dissertation, I received an inspected call from Jorge asking me to meet. We met at the mirror office for what I expected would be the last time. I anticipated that Jorge would tell me that he enjoyed meeting me, but that the process of the research project would just not work out. This is how much he thought that I was going to tell him, ah, screw you, we're not going to do it. Instead, Jorge invited me to tell the story of Sim. Uh, he said, I need someone who's going to get under my skin to really understand what, we're, what we do, what Sim is, which is our student immigrant movement organization, and then to write this into a book about immigrant youth organizing. I accepted. <laughs> That's Tom, you know. We shook hands, and I attended my first recruitment meeting training for the same members the following month. Tom sat down with me for hours, and he asked me only a question. Explain me what you're doing. And in the dissertation, it says that he took the role of student, and I took the role of teacher. I was 20 at that time, and he was 40 in his 40s. And he was, I, didn't, I dropped out of college, and he was a PhD candidate. And he had the humbleness and the comfortableness to listen to me for hours of hours, day in and day out, listen not just to me, but to the whole student group in Massachusetts, and really, I think, empower me to think that I was a scientist in the craft that I was doing, and really gave me, at least for me, and I think to our peers, that what we were doing was actually made sense. Not just because he was just affirming us, but because he built a relationship through, a comedia, through academia and us that was healthy and was reciprocal. And I really think that is the relationship that we should enter. 
within scholars, within people in the academia world, and with people in the community, in the most affected community, in the organizations. That not a power, that is not who's better, who's more, but really about that all your research should be guided for immigrant justice, for people having more rights, for people having more opportunity, for people to find, like Tom did with me, that what we're doing makes sense, or if we don't even understand it, for them to provide some of the resources based on the research that help us understand. I cannot tell you how many times Tom told me, is what you're doing what this other professor is saying? And I was like, yes, but I didn't know that existed, so let me go read that because I'm probably missing stuff, you know? And I'll read you one last line from Tom and then we'll end this. Tom said, uh, let's see, the speech had been developed with the editorial, oh, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. let's see. Jorge Sandoval, that's supposed to be me, who in turn had adapted his narrative template from Professor Marshall Gans. So I took this from another professor. I just want you to see the relationship that we had with academia in developing our theories for organizing. I had studied from Professor Marshall Media Organizing course at Harvard University, blah, blah. The narrative outline begins by describing a challenge that isn't fair, making a choice about how to respond to this challenge and the outcome of that choice. Social movement scholars have long referred to the challenges of or wrongs as grievances. Further, social movement organizers seek to frame grievances that will resonate with a broader audience and align with the core values in society, the snow and Bedford, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, the grievance was being denied her dreams of the college despite the hard work and excellent grades, and the choice was to fight. He should, he's talking in this context about a story of a student that we were crafting, and he's pretty much telling in this part of the book how we went to another professor to learn how to tell stories, and how we're crafting the whole story based on this theory of storytelling. Is this making sense? So for us, it was a whole learning about the science of movements and the science of organizations, which I think you all can be very useful at for the struggle and be part of it and be part of the community that will take to create migrant justice in the world, I think, in the next 100 years, if we can even get to that in that time. So I'll end. That's the thing. That's my contact. And I just want to thank you so much for giving me the pleasure to address you in this afternoon. Thank you.